Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Online Sociologist. My name is Ryan. Before we begin, I want you to tell me if you can tell the difference between these images. In these images, we see money, a graduation, a border wall, and someone who is sick. You give up? To sociologists, all of these things can be defined as a social construction. In this video, I'm going to define social construction and explain why some sociologists might look at the previous images as social constructions. So, to many sociologists, a social construction can literally be anything. They are material things and ideas. They are individual concepts and larger systems of knowledge. They are of what we think of as art or science. They can also be defined as emotions, behaviors, um, traditions, as well as even larger cultures. In short, a social construction is something brought into existence by groups of people and is accepted as true by that group. People go about their daily lives not questioning the validity of these social constructions and behave as if they exist in nature. In fact, if one usually stops to think about and question the nature of these social constructions, they are usually thought of as weird or rebuked by the group in other ways. In all, the creation and adherence to social constructions is part of the glue holding society together as it provides all people in a social group a common understanding of how the world acts and operates and how it should be perceived. So, Let's move into our examples that we defined in the beginning. How is money a social construct? Now, one of the biggest reasons is, is that money is part of a larger economy, which in itself is a social construct. All the economy is, is it's a system of production and exchange that provides material goods to people within a group. In other words, people grow, collect, or build stuff, and then trade it with other people for other stuff that they might need. All money is, is a transaction. So instead of bringing a sack of potatoes to the clothing store to purchase clothes, you instead provide that person selling clothes money, which can be in material form such as paper, metal, or plastic, or it can be in digital form. In other words, instead of directly trading a sack of potatoes for, let's say, a shirt, the person selling clothes can now purchase a sack of potatoes with that money or anything else that they might want or need. Money has become a central part in our current type of economy, which can be defined as capitalism, which is a type of economy in which industries and trades are controlled by private owners who produce goods and services for profits. More than that, as a social construct, the only reason that money, or for that matter the economy in general, has power is because a large majority of society buys into its meaning. These people either trust the institutions that distribute that money and claim it has worth, or they fear the consequences of not buying into that system, which is mainly impoverishment or the lack of money to buy things. In the next image, we saw a graduation. A graduation is simply a made-up rite of passage. It is a ceremony or occasion to mark one's completion of another social construction, the education system. More than symbolizing the completion of a school's curriculum, a graduation can also mark other things, such as the passage from being a child to being an adult, or the passage from education into going to the workforce. Rites of passage aren't only structured in the educational institution, however. They are also prominent in religious communities. In the Christian religion, for example, you have baptisms, communions for those who are Catholic, as well as weddings. Such rites are also structured through other cultural institutions and largely structured around age. Take the quinceanera celebration, which has its roots in Mesoamerica tradition that marks a girl's 15th birthday and her passage from girlhood to womanhood. Or the more general Sweet 16 in North America, which is another form of a coming-to-age celebration and rite of passage. Many of us go through these rites of passage and their celebrations knowing that they are important, but it is very rare that we truly investigate the social nature and the meaning of these rites, and it is even more rare that we question our participation in it. And if we do question our role in it, or its importance, we are usually met with severe backlash from family and community members. The third example is the border wall. 
While numerous border walls exist throughout the world, this particular one separates Mexico from the United States. However, political borders aren't natural, but instead socially constructed over time and through intense negotiation. Rachel St. John's historical book, Line in the Sand, a, his a History of the Western U.S.-Mexico Border, provides a historical account to look at the processes, negotiations, and struggles that not only went into the social construction of the U.S.-Mexico border, but more importantly, its transformations. Despite its socially constructed nature and its socially constructed remaking, the border, especially a border symbolized by this wall, is accepted as a truth. More than that, it has become a truth within a larger, socially constructed legal network that includes who can cross that border, for what reason, and for how long. The final example I want to look at is sickness. How do we know if we are sick? We usually determine this by one of a number of ways. One way is to gauge how we feel currently on how we felt when we were once sick. However, how did we know when we were sick previously? We maybe compared our symptoms to a generalized list of symptoms in the database, such as WebMD. Or we went to a specific social institution that housed authoritative knowledge on the subject, such as a doctor's office. And also that doctor's office had the authority to classify you as either sick or healthy. Therefore, while how we physically and mentally feel may be real, what constitutes as a sickness is something that is socially constructed. The social construction of sickness can better be analyzed through what was considered a sickness before. For example, up until 1973, the American Psychiatric Association considered homosexuality a mental illness. Now, it doesn't. More than transformations in what is considered a sickness, we can also more clearly see how sickness is socially constructed through current cases of what is known as contested illnesses, such as chronic fatigue syndrome. Based upon these examples, we see several criteria for how social constructions are produced and maintained. First and foremost, social constructions are produced and maintained socially. In other words, this isn't an individual effort, but instead you need multiple people to buy into the legitimacy of the social construction. Second, social constructions are based on and maintained through trust. This not only includes other people, but also the institutions and societies that create and maintain them. Third, the meaning and form of social constructions can transform throughout time based on negotiation and conflict. Fourth, social constructions are often hidden. We usually go through our everyday lives not thinking about all of the socially constructed things and ideas making up our existence. Fifth, social constructions become visible when actively contested or questioned. This contestation and or question not only makes the socially constructed nature of something visible, but also creates social backlash by other members of the group. Finally, while social constructions and the meanings attached to them are created and maintained by humans, they also help determine how people act. In other words, people confront social constructs as having a power unto themselves. This can relate to what the sociologist Emile Durkheim calls a social fact. A social fact can be defined as meanings, ideas, beliefs, or values that transcend the individual and exercise control over that individual. In other words, while a social fact was created by humans, it now controls humans. This can also relate to the Thomas theorem, which was formulated by William Isaac Thomas and Dorothy Swain Thomas in 1928. The Thomas theorem simply means if humans describe situations as real, they are real in their consequences. So, for example, if money is a social construct, well, then so is poverty, which is defined as the lack of money. However, while money and poverty might be social constructs, they are defined as real in society, thus have real consequences. Without money, one cannot acquire necessities essential to living. While all sociologists believe much of our lived experience is socially constructed, some sociologists subscribe to this belief more than others. In fact, some scholars argue there is no objective knowledge of reality, or reality itself, only the reality that we construct. 
This has caused a large debate not only between large, the larger population and sociologists, but also within sociological groups themselves. By denying an objective reality, these sociologists are denying the Enlightenment principle of scientific inquiry, which promises to uncover an objective reality through the scientific method and its procedures. To social constructionists, all scientific knowledge in itself is socially constructed. Furthermore, if there is no objective reality, there is no objective truth to uncover. Every group then has their own truths, and none of these truths has a larger claim to reality. In other words, to a social constructionist, somebody who believes that the earth is flat has as much of a claim to truth than those who believe that the earth is in the shape of a sphere. I want to thank you all for watching this video. Make sure that you like and subscribe for more content related to the world of sociology and how it can be used not only in the classroom, but also in your everyday lives. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.